So, uh, Brooks, thanks so much for, for being with us. We are really fortunate to have um, Brooks presenting to us tonight. So, I, Brooks has been associated with Tumamak in the university for so many years. Um, you're actually going to have to tell us, Brooks, when the first time you actually formally started working with the Hill was. I'm thinking it's a couple of decades, even. Yeah, it's, um, it's been a few years. And so, uh, so Brooks is a professor in the um, of architecture in the uh, College of Architecture, uh, Landscape Design, and Architecture, Capla. Uh, and in that space, in which we'll be talking about to us tonight, his work directly talks about cultural landscapes and um, kind of understanding them from a lot of different perspectives, uh, but, it, but it also very much from the architectural perspective. In addition to that, though, uh, Brooks now is uh, Assistant Vice President for Research within RII, the uh, Research Innovation and Impact uh, Universe within the university, and has had several key roles uh, of leadership with RII, uh, including being um, well, I don't even know. I forget what the first role you had with RI was, Brooks, and then the transition into the interim chief of staff during this recent transition, and now are managing managing space for pretty much the entire university. Um, but throughout all of this, uh, Tumamak has been such a core piece of, of you, and you're, you're such an important knowledge bearer of the Hill. And so one of the things that has benefited me a ton was I, when I came into my position, it published in about 2005, maybe it was a little after that, there is a, a, a document, the Tumac Hill Management uh, Policy or Management Plan, which is takes a cultural perspective first and foremost above the ecology um, in looking at the Tumac Hill and the Desert Laboratory. And Brooks led that effort. And it was kind of a wonderful primer and guide to me getting my legs under me and thinking about how the hill can and should be managed and really putting that cultural perspective first, which had honestly been under-recognized for many years. So, so I continue to owe you a great debt of gratitude, Brooks, for doing that. And we continue to have your voice in the, the Tumaki Hill Advisory Council and as a dear friend and, and such a great knowledge. So thanks for taking the time to be with us tonight. Well, thanks, Ben. I appreciate the introduction. I'm gonna share my screen so we can uh, uh, get that focused up. Uh, and Brooks, did you want to tell folks um, about answering, asking questions during? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so we talked ahead of time. First of all, um, uh, as I was telling Trika, I've never zoomed at night. So I have this sort of weird light on me right now. And if I fade into obscurity, it's probably a good thing, as long as you can see the presentation. <laughs> Um, the, the way I, I love doing presentations is that it's not just a, a unilateral <clears throat> monologue, but rather um, use the slides and the talk as, a, as an opportunity to engage in some discussion. So I would appreciate that if you have questions uh, with the slide that's up, <clears throat> go ahead and put something in the chat, raise your hand, and I've asked Trika to kind of manage those, or Ben, uh, to, to make sure that uh, if you have questions, that would be, that'd be great. And, and, and I appreciate the introduction. And I have been at the university for 32 years. And part of this is that I've had the honor of working with uh, great people. Uh, and two of them are on the call tonight. One is Nancy Odegaard, the other is Larry Venable, that, uh, who have always been engaged for the Hill. And, and the, the credit uh, for the cultural resource management plan that Ben alluded to that I'm going to make reference to later on was really an effort. Nancy was a part of that to, and a whole team of people um, to really uh, begin to not have culture dominate, but have it be seen as in balance with the natural features that were so long a part of the identity of the hill. And I think part of the, the what, what, one of the outcomes of that whole discussion was this slide presentation. So this slide presentation has its origins in really trying to um, create a context in which people understood Tumamak as this immensely diverse place that has so many different values and that so many people look at the hill with one particular lens. And 
don't really sort of didn't have the opportunity to take a look at it with a much more integrated holistic lens. And so the, the concept of cultural landscapes is one that's common in heritage conservation, uh, but isn't always part of the lexicon of many of the people who are outside of that particular disciplinary area. And so when we had a conversation uh, and Ben asked me to, to speak to this group, um, I thought that this might be a really good topic. And so I, I dusted off this presentation, updated it a little bit, um, and, and I'd like to use it as a forum for, for these kinds of conversations. Um, so let me go ahead and click forward here. So like any good instructor, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say. I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to tell you what I said uh, so that it's uh, repeatable then. Um, in terms of an outline, I'd like to kind of define what cultural landscapes are, because I'm assuming not everyone is familiar with the term and really understand the, the kind of broad uh, framework that we're talking about. And part of that is not only sort of definitions, but what are constructs or kind of ways of looking at the, at the hill and ways of using cultural landscapes as a vocabulary to begin to describe how we, we address and bring value and meaning to the hill uh, from multiple perspectives. And the second part, I'm gonna sort of take a look at the hill uh, as features. And this includes natural features as well as um, cultural features. Again, to try to begin to understand this sort of integrated um, uh, holistic kind of uh, approach to taking a look at it. And then try to wrap it all together at the end to take a look at Tumamak Hill as this integrated environment and to see how we move forward uh, with this uh, different kind of an approach. So first some definitions. So cultural landscapes, the term cultural landscapes has been around for almost a century uh, and was introduced by this guy, Carl Saar, uh, who was a cultural geographer and introduced the idea of a cultural landscape. And you can see the quote there, it's fashioned from a natural landscape by a cultural group. And so almost anything from ranches uh, in, the, in rural areas to urban environments could really be seen as a cultural landscape. Uh, but the idea is that there is a dependency or an interdependency uh, between the human activities that take place on that particular area and the natural features that, that sustain it. And so it's this idea of how do humans and nature engage with each other. <clears throat> and as you can see here, he describes it like a painting. So culture is the agent, the natural area is the medium, and the cultural landscape is the result. This guy, G.B. Jackson, who was uh, uh, one of the people that I studied when I went to school, um, because he really talked about vernacular landscapes. Uh, which is another area that I'm, I'm fascinated with, uh, particularly around southern Arizona, because we so, have such a diverse set of cultural landscapes here. I really appreciate this quote because I think it under, puts it into a context and kind of neutralizes how we approach both buildings and artifacts as well as landscapes. That landscape is history made visible. The attempt to derive meaning from landscapes possesses overwhelming virtue keeps us constantly alert to the world around us, demanding that we pay attention not just to some of the things around us, but to all of them. The whole visible world and all of its rich, glorious, messy, confusing, ugly, and beautiful complexity. So again, part of this is that there is a, uh, not a hierarchy given to one or the other, but they're all part of the human in, uh, engagement with the landscape and that we need to sort of take a look at it with sort of neutral lenses. And th this isn't just in the world of scholarship that this term of cultural landscapes comes in. And so you can see some of the major agencies, both national and international, have defined cultural landscapes. And they pretty much all say the, the, about the same thing. But one of the things that really becomes important, you can see it right here, is cultural landscapes provides a sense of place and identity to map our relationship with the land over time. So in addition to sort of understanding natural features and natural values, but also human values and then how they evolved over time. And I think Tumamak Hill is a great case study for how we can take a look at this as a cultural landscape. And you can see even the last one here, <clears throat> when the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan came on, they defined cultural landscapes as one of the 
the ways in which they approached the larger um, uh, conservation plan. So speaking of sense of place, I, I try to use this definition to really begin to uh, understand the relationship between what are tangible and intangible. So the idea that we have to understand that when we give meaning to something, <clears throat> that meaning or identity or significance is really an intangible. It's an intangible value that we give to it and oftentimes is very subjective. But what, we, what is embodied in those tangible uh, values are the actual objects that we're talking about. So it's the idea of connecting these tangible characteristics of the environment, whether they're natural or built, with the intangible values. In other words, we can't really touch them. And so these intangible values can be defined in multiple ways, environmental values, cultural values, technological values, economic, political, and aesthetic. So oftentimes when I speak to pub the public about architecture, I, I put up a slide that's similar to this. And I say, when we talk about architecture, oftentimes all we really look at or, or see as a value is aesthetic. And so we approach architecture as either being ugly or beautiful. When in fact, architecture like landscapes in general and artifacts and other cultural objects really need to be seen in the lens that is much more complex and understand that there are values of the time that it was created. And that for us to interpret those values, then we need to understand what meaning was given to them when they were built and how they've acquired value and a meaning over time. So let's talk about constructs then. These are sort of, again, ways of sort of uh, uh, viewing or, um, or frameworks by which we can begin to understand landscapes and cultural landscapes in particular. So you can see in these constructs here, and again, I didn't make these up. These are ones that are used as, as lenses by which we can take a look at uh, landscape. And I've given some examples, images here of, of examples using Tumumak Hill. So again, there are many people in disciplines that derive their own sense of identity from the lens by which they approach looking at landscape. So one is landscape as nature. So we're taking a look at very specific features, including topography, landscape as habitat. And you're all familiar with this because Tumumak Hill is a habitat for a variety of different communities, um, animal as well as vegetative. And landscape as system also, the idea that there's a relationship between where water is and where animals are, and where there are, uh, are cultivatable fields and where there is um, bedrock. And all of these have a relationship to how humans have engaged as well as animals and other communities have engaged with various kinds of natural features. There's also landscape as aesthetic. We often take a look at, at views and vistas and certainly the walkers approach this as well and beginning to understand that there is an aesthetic value that's given to landscapes. There's landscape as artifact and I include the, the sort of uh, you know, notion of landscape as icon when we talk about Yosemite we think of this as an iconic landscape because of the way in which it is created both by people like Ansel Adams who have iconized the, the, the sort of whole notion of natural landscapes, as well as the idea of landscape in our urban landscape by things like McDonald's or big box architecture, which has become as much a part of our landscape. And again, whether it's good, bad or ugly, it defines what our landscape looks like and the values that are embodied in how we approach those landscapes. And finally, landscape as ideology. So you all know the Tumumak Hill is, uh, was a sacred place. It was part of a, a Cerro de Trincheras system of, of hills that extended throughout Sonora, northern Sonora, and into southern Arizona as a means of, of connecting spiritual places. And the whole notion of ritual landscapes was much more sophisticated by uh, prehistoric cultures than we do in our current culture. And so this idea of landscape scale, geo-ritual spaces was much more of a part of that vocabulary, that cosmological vocabulary, um, and must be understood, particularly if we want to interpret and respect and honor the value that some of these places are given by native uh, communities and uh, the ancestors of the, of the native tribes that were here before. <clears throat> OK, 
continuing on with these constructs, often landscape is seen as wealth. So, you know, in much of my world in architecture, if I talk to developers, they take a look at land as being an opportunity for development. And so that's the only lens that they're looking at. So they're looking at the sort of, you've heard it before, the highest and best value of a particular piece of land. And so by taking a look at landscape as wealth, that is one lens by which a segment of our population review, uh, views it. And so we can take a look at economic value in a variety of ways, including that of on top of Tumumak Hill, where we're seeing that the same sacred quality of being at a high elevation is also makes it ideal for telecommunication towers. And the idea that there is a value that is given to our society, and it's an economic value as well as a technological value that's given to our, our, our community by understanding Tumumak Hill for that, uh, with that lens. And of course, there's landscape as history. And so particularly with Native American tribes, the way that they understand their history is always tied to the land. And they talk about, or through oral histories, they talk about their relationship with the land, where they have planted and cultivated uh, things, where life events have taken place in their relationship with the land. And then finally, <clears throat> landscape as place, which is a very distinctive human uh, endeavor, where by the act, by the human act of designation, we have changed the character of that place. And so simply by denoting something as being significant or being on, for example, the National Register of Historic Places, it has changed the way in which we take a look at it because it has been assigned a particular kind of meaning due to a, um, a, a statement of significance that's been given to it. And what, what is implied in that also is a level of protection. So it's not always uh, consistent or at the same level as the level of significance. It's seen as a opportunity for protection of that particular landscape. So again, this idea you know, and it's called the, the National uh, Register of Historic Places uh, on which many of our uh, architectural as well as archeological places are held as a registry. And so they're identified as places simply because they did not want to identify them as buildings or sites or landscapes, but as places worthy of, of, of much uh, more uh, deeper meaning and significance. And you can see here, this is a map of the of the National Register of the Archaeological District uh, that's on top of the hill. So just, just a, a sidebar here, um, and going back to the history of, of the hill, that the, the Tumumak Hill, as you know, was on the National Register of Historic Places as a landmark long, uh, a, a, for a long time, but only as an ecological reserve. So it was seen for its ecological value first, and designated for that first as an ecological preserve. It was only later in the 1990s and then later into the aughts that the archeological evidence became part of the, the dossier of the National Register of Historic Places designated uh, nomination for the hill, where it began to take in the human and the, the archeological record, as well as the layer of, of significance that again was part of this multifaceted meaning that's given to the hill. So again, as I mentioned before, part of the reason for this slide presentation originally was to sort of elevate this value of the cultural significance of the hill on top of what has already been designated as the ecological value um, and meaning of the hill. Let's talk a little bit about the features. <clears throat> So there are, are natural features here that and we've talked about them before. There is the geomorphology or the, the shape of the land, right? So there's the fact that it is elevated above the, the Tucson Basin and has made it a promontory uh, for, for millennia for humans to use, uh, but it also represents this, this sort of geological feature that, that is uplifted from the rest of the basin. There's also the ecology of the hill. Uh, so beginning to understand the unique qualities of the ecology of the hill, which again has driven research for well over a century and has become, uh, as continues to happen and is a part of the meaning and the, the, um, the, the impact and legacy of the hill as it continues on. 
There's also cultural features. And I've divided these, these features into two phases. One is the, the prehistoric features, which again is part of the archeological record. And you can see some of the, the examples of them here, as well as this list. And these are all features that were listed in this revised National Register for Historic Places nomination that identified these various types of archeological features. But you can see these, these bedrock mortars that are here, these open areas that were used as pit structures that are clearly outlined that are here, as well as the trincheras, this sort of rock wall that was created along the edges to create terraces for agricultural uh, uh, purposes then. But you know, what is often under-recognized are some of the unsexy things, the sort of water control features that are critically important to the sustaining of life on top of the hill and tell the entire a uh, holistic story of what a sustainable livelihood would be like on the top of the hill. And the cultural period, when we get into the historic period, there is evidence of, first of all, a quarry uh, that was there. Uh, this quarry was abandoned after the A Mountain Quarry came on. Uh, once the hill was designated as a, as a sacred, uh, not a sacred place, but as a preserve in the early 1900s, all quarrying of, of stone was stopped. And that's why they moved back to the, the A Mountain or Sent Sentinel Peak uh, quarry that was there. But we also have uh, the vegetative research plots, which began in the early 1900s. Uh, these were very early in terms of um, uh, where the research began. And then finally with the Carnegie Desert Laboratory <clears throat> beginning in 1903 with the establishment of a permanent field station uh, and laboratory uh, facility on the knee of the hill was established. And you can see here, this is a contemporary um, image of that compound of buildings, the lab, the desert lab right here. Um, there's the USGF building here, as well as the chemistry building and some of the other outlying uh, buildings that are here. But it's important to note that the desert lab, when it was first created and constructed in 1903, was really constructed as an L-shaped building. It was only later that it actually formed a full view uh, to what you see today. <clears throat> but from an architectural standpoint, when we take a look at this building, it is highly unique. It's unique because it's using rock that was found on the site and it, was, uh, it didn't have to be quarried, but was found and built these buildings that were incredibly adaptive to the desert and the harshness of the desert surroundings. So not only do you have walls that are made of earthen materials, rock, uh, and that are very, very thick to begin to temper the, the sort of changes of temperature that happen between night and day and between season and season throughout the year, but also the creation of a roof structure where you've got um, a series of vents that created a ventilated space that connected to other openings within the, the building itself to naturally ventilate out the air, to allow hot air to be flushed out and to keep the inside as cool as possible long before there was mechanical systems for air conditioning. So these are, I, I use these as a, as a case study of appropriate vernacular sustainable architecture, not because it's made out of stone, but the fact that they used very clear principles that are time proven about how to dwell in the desert and how to take advantage of of things like the thermal mass of a wall, as well as very, very strategic kinds of ventilations. So these are incredibly important buildings to look at as models of sustainable architecture. We have other buildings that were created, the, the shop building, often known as the boathouse down at the bottom of the hill. Again, the same kind of principle of very thick walls. Uh, it's not as deep of, a, of an eave uh, that allows that ventilation but it wasn't really intended to be habitated uh, very often. And in this case, if you've been inside of it, you know that it has a, it was basically built out of brick, then it has a stone uh, veneer that was built uh, over it. Um, same thing here, the chemistry lab. And then this kind of, uh, I, I think of as a kind of a strange anomaly of a building uh, because it was built much later when, when the sort of Santa Fe style was very popular in Tucson and they built this basically as a Santa Fe building, but they had to use the materials that were the same 
as on the rest of the hill. And so used again, the same kind of stone veneer uh, on this building, but with the vigas that are more characteristic of the Santa Fe style. And I think it's also important to understand that archeological research began. So the idea that there were humans on the hill that were studying the previous generations uh, of, of cultures that were here. Again, beginning to add those layers of value uh, in terms of how we understand the hill. And it took generations for us to interpret the meaning of, and I heard that uh, you heard from the fishes um, earlier. And so you had the chance to sort of understand how um, the, the, the stories of, of, uh, the, of the previous um, communities that were there. It's also important, just like we were mentioning before, because of the, the height of the hill that was used uh, as an observatory. And so, as you know, there's still observatories up on top of the hill um, that, um, that were there, as well as the telecommunication towers um, for exactly the same reason, because it's the tallest place to do uh, the kind of um, work that give value to the, to the hill. Let's talk a little bit about then kind of bringing this together and talking about Tumumak Hill as a cultural landscape. So I mentioned before this idea of how we create place as a, as a human generated designation and in doing so change the meaning of the landscape. And oftentimes it brings protective measures, but it also brings a sort of a change of mindset about how we approach uh, the look at the, at the hill. And so starting off with you know, 1903, when the Desert Laboratory was created, it began as a, a mere 40 acres and very quickly then expanded to a much larger area, up to 800, over 800 acres that were here. The USFS uh, Forest Service established an experimental station in 1940. University of Arizona uh, added 500 or part of the 509 nine acres that was there in the 1960s, which also brought in the observatories. It became a National Historic Landmark in 1965. Um, you may not know this as context, but this is very early uh, in terms of how we, how uh, Tumumak Hill was on the minds of people as being a sacred place, not for its archeological reserve or for its connection to native peoples, but because of its ecological value then. Um, then a year later, put on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, 1966, for those of you who are familiar with the history of historic preservation, was really a watershed year for the creation of things like the National Register. And so this was one of the first properties in the city of Tucson that was put on the National Register of Historic Places. In 1976, it was uh, designated as a National Environmental Study Area, 81 designated as a scientific and educational Hey Brooks, um, you have frozen nine when when the archaeological district was actually established. Is there a Brooks? question? Yes. Yeah, Brooks, hi, this is Trika. Um, I don't know if it happened for others, but uh, we we lost you at the past 10 seconds or something. You froze there. If you could okay. just repeat what you just said. Starting at the 1981 uh, point. Sure. So I, you know, I've just been sort of listing these down. Uh, but again, there is a there is a, a designation here as a place in danger. And so I think early on it was identified that Tumuak Hill was in going down a road of not being protected. It was uh, overtaken in many cases by uh, walkers uh, who saw it as a park as opposed to a research uh, laboratory. And there were archaeologists and anthropologists who saw the ecology as overtaking the, the other value and meaning of the hill. And so that prompted this idea of, of having a uh, uh, it designated as the most endangered places within the state of Arizona. And again, part of this was a raising of awareness, but this designation, this act of designation, then adds a layer of how people are comprehending both the meaning as well as the, um, the call to action that needed to take place. 
Um, again, 2009, the archaeological district was added. And again, this, this year, as I mentioned, I may have cut out, was a full generation after when it was originally put on the National Register of Historic Places. But by that time, the, the documentation was clear enough to be able to make the case for the significance of an archaeological district that was integrated into the larger nomination as an ecological preserve. And then finally, 2010, Pima County established the conservation uh, area, which is adjacent to it, which is part of the uh, additional 345 acres. But you can see that what, what we've got here is not only a history of, of people engaging with the hill, but also uh, people designating the hill for all of these different lenses that we've just talked about. So recognizing that the hill is a very special place, but how do we bring it together in a comprehensive way so that individual lenses don't take up all of the space? And it, was there a way in which we could begin to think about this in a much more integrated framework? When we talk about when we were creating the, the cultural resource management plan, one of the first things that we did was to list out all of the, what might be called stakeholders, the people who were current users and who had sort of, uh, who had uses on the land. And this is an impressive list in terms of the lenses that each of these bring to it. And again, remember all of those different constructs. Some people look at land as for its economic value. Some people look at it for their sacred value. And so we need to understand that all of these different stakeholders had that particular, had their own lens on the land. So whether it was seen as a, uh, what is known in, and sort of preservation parlance is a traditional cultural place by all the, the five southern tribes of Arizona uh, that, that saw Tumumak Hill as being sacred as part of their ancestral heritage. We saw this uh, as a desert ecosystem research by the College of Science as well as the U.S. Geological Survey. The archaeological research, and in other words, the study of of, of past humans, humans in their past and on the land from anthropology as well as the Arizona State Museum. Again, the economic value that's given to the hill and by the use of telecommunication towers that are there. We have another economic value of the rights of way leases that transect uh, the, the hill and its property, as well as recreation and spirituality. So we have so many people who go to the hill for recreation but also for a sense of spirituality. They go to redeem them on their own selves. And they, they do this in a way which they connect with that landscape, they connect with the inherent spirituality, but also I think the inherent sense of a community of others who are seeking the same kind of respite, and the same kind of value and meaning from being on the hill. So these are all, all the complex multiple stakeholders that needed to be sort of brought into a room, so to speak, in order for us to understand what are, what are the values that they bring to their understanding of the hill and how do we create a management plan that allows us to have a partnership with all of them that we understand the common, um, a common purpose in preserving the hill uh, for what it needs to be for all of these. A map that uh, Ben just provided to me shows the current ownership. So you can see the color coding here, the sort of brown and, and uh, purple representing the University of Arizona. That's this area right here, which includes the, the, uh, the, the knee of the hill where the lab is, as well as the top of the hill where the telecommunication towers are. Here's A Mountain and the Mountain Park by the city of Tucson. And then Pima County, which added the rest of the acreage over here. And as well. So not only are we talking about various stakeholders, we have various owners that occupy and, and that are assigned this particular area from a jurisdictional and from a, a, a sort of a political jurisdictional uh, basis of the hill. So what, what we're seeing here are all these various different kinds of, of, um, of uh, demands that are on the hill in addition to values. And so part of this then became the challenge of bringing all these together. And so if we were to define some ongoing concerns, then as we move forward with this, one of the things that we, as I mentioned before, was a sort of 
the idea of multiple and sometimes conflicting values among all the stakeholders that were mentioned. And then there was a common need when, for a greater protection of both the natural and the cultural resources that were there. And then the need for greater awareness of the management and common stewardship responsibilities. So this became the key driver here, is that we all understood this notion of stewardship. And the idea that we needed to create a document and a, a roadmap that allowed for a common management tool with this common um, uh, mission and, and vision of stewardship of the hill. And so that became the driving factor that, that really drove our ability to, to create this management plan that, was, that um, respected all of the various kinds of stakeholders that were there. So one of the images, this is an old image, but showed the top of the hill that if you saw nothing else, what you saw was that this was basically an antenna farm and you know, continues to be an antenna farm. Though it now has been, many of these have been consolidated into one antenna here. But you can see the sort of, the, to use J.B. Jackson's term, the ugliness of that landscape. But it represented these values of economic value of, of that particular land, regardless of how other people saw the value of the hill. And so, and the other is this image I took the other day, uh, which to me was very telling. This idea that we have this kind of institutional sign that is meant to sort of claim ownership and also, you know, management of, of the particular hill and identifying the various political entities as well as the institutional entities that are in charge of the hill. But we understand that the hill is also a shrine and it is used and, it, and this sign ends up being the place in which the, the balancing of these, these kinds of value systems is poignantly balanced. Uh, in this particular image, where we begin to understand that there needs to be this sort of balanced value. And I swear, this is such a Tucson thing. You know, the idea of, of having this, this kind of shared value of, of making, uh, recognizing that there needs to be an institutional management of the Hill, uh, but at the same time, having a respect and a recognition of the spiritual quality and how people attach that spiritual quality to place and a respect for the balance of both of those. And so in 2008, uh, the, the Tumamak Hill Cultural Resource Policy and Management Plan was, was finally enacted. It was a team effort, as I said before, it involved um, multiple stakeholders from archeologists uh, and the scholarly community uh, to other, uh, to uh, planning, uh, design and construction. Um, to, to really create a, a management plan that began to recognize all of these different values and begin to chart a vision forward for this. Uh, and if you, you know, there's a URL there that you can take a look at it. If you just Google Tumamak management plan, you should be able to find it uh, on Google if you're interested in it. And I know Ben said he uses it as a reference and I still do too. It's a marvelous document simply for the documentation of the cultural resources and the evolution of those cultural resources over time. Um, but the clear goal here was to protect and preserve the prehistoric and historic resources of Tubamak Hill so that continued ecological research and education opportunities in this historic setting will be safeguarded for the benefit of future generations. So you see here the idea that even though this was meant to be a cultural resources management plan, it was a recognition that the ecological research was a vital part of the cultural history of the hill and that there needed to be a balance between them, but both sides needed to recognize the value of each. And then finally, this idea of fostering a community, this is where the stewardship comes in, fostering a community collaboration and a sense of public investment for the protection and preservation of the hill. So with this as sort of a, 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 a foundation, then, what uh, was created, and, and I think Ben is actually the, uh, you know, an extension of this, is a series of management decisions that were made by the university, including leadership on the Hill, where we began to balance those value systems and begin to reach out the creation of a stewards, the, the stewards program, the creation of art programs, the creation of a variety of different programs, the citizen science programs that allowed for public engagement and for a recognition of all of these different values on the Hill so that there was a, there was a balance. And as the, 
your pre-presentation conversations uh, a test, this is still, you know, it's not done yet. There is still a lot of negotiation that needs to go on between the users and the various stakeholders that are here, whether it's wearing masks or respecting the protocols of walking on the hill. There still needs to be that constant vigilance. But I, you know, to look back at 2006 or 2008 and see where we are now, it's a hell of a lot better than what it was. And, and again, I, I give credit to Ben for, for his leadership because I think he's been the, the sort of the capstone of, of this effort in terms of bringing this attention and balanced approach to being not only good stewards, but being advocates for all of these different values that are on the Hill. And so finally, I just wanna end, I spent a lot of this presentation kind of deconstructing the Hill, but I think it's really important that we recognize that it, we don't, we don't, in our mind's eye, we don't see it as a, as a differentiated kind of approach to the hill, uh, but rather as one unified place. And so I think this notion of sense of place that we talked about before really is embodied in, in all of these different elements, but this notion that this, this whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I think this is where Tumamak Hill then really defines its own unique place and their own sense of, of, of meaning um, to, to everyone who's there. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to take on any, any questions. I do not see any hands up. If you wanna put hands up, um, if you open up your chat box or your participants box, you can, um, Raise a hand with any questions. Um, I, I have a question while people are pondering. Um, Brooks, uh, you didn't bring in the rainwater harvesting um, element in there. And that to me is such a unique feature. And as I understand right. it, it was pretty much one of the first original rainwater harvesting systems uh, in the city, and now, of course, it's so popular. Um, do you have any comments on that and and uh, its uh, meaning in terms of a contribution to the cultural landscape? Sure, and and I agree, and I and I should have brought it up um, because I was up on the hill and with with Ben the other week, last week, and uh, was actually looking at the at the reservoir. Um, it was unique, and and I think again as a as a testament to the idea that they wanted to create a, a self sufficient um, community in the lab, and and I think again they were modeling the sort of sustainable approach to creating a compound of buildings, and so collecting the rainwater and putting it into a a cistern like that and being able to use that was just part of that ethic, and I I don't think it was the first in Tucson. Uh, I think collecting rainwater was very typical of, of uh, 19th century um, uh, community in Tucson, uh, but, uh, but the idea that it was collected in a systematic way as part of a, I think a, an intended design uh, was unique. And I think it's a credit to the scientists and the, and the builders that were building uh, the Desert Lab. I agree. Well, um, while you're answering that, we got a couple of other questions. Um, but thanks, I, I appreciate your comments on that. First, uh, Mary, your hand was up, and then after Mary, Lily. So Mary Kemp has a question. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, the only question that really came up for me was you mentioned that the building, the original building was built with found rock, and was that rock directly in the vicinity, and was there maybe damage to trincheras in the building of that, or do, is that not known? I, I, I'm not aware of any evidence uh, one way or the other. Uh, so the, the records say it was made with found stone. So, in, you know, that's a contrast to quarrying. Uh, so, yeah, who knows where they actually came from. And yes, they may have taken from the trincheras walls. You know, it's, it's unclear. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Good question. Lily. Okay. Um, just a question about the cultural side of um, of 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 the of the hill near the sh the shrine. I don't see any graffiti, thank goodness, or put or or trash in that area. 
is there anyone who's maintaining, you know, that area? Because people do leave rosaries or notes or pictures. I don't know if there's ever been human ashes. And what do you do in those situations? Yeah, I didn't even include the shrine in this presentation. I, I, I had that image of the, the sign that was right out on Anklum. Um, you know, I didn't even talk about the shrine. Um, but, uh, you know, because I think, again, people see it as part of the experience of Tumamak Hill. It's, it's, it's semi-religious. And I think that there is a recognition of, of preserving that and the, the sacredness of it. Um, I, I think it just takes constant stewardship. And I think, just like I'm sure this group has talked about, if you model stewardship and there is a shared uh, recognition of the value, then everyone can contribute to being stewards. And you'll have ambassadors who adopt that, uh, that ethic of stewardship and will become as fiercely advocates of, of, the, of pres preserving the hill and all of its cultural elements as much as those like you who are designated stewards. Curious um, if you know if there have been any uh, claims of ownership um, from you know native uh, people that had been using the the hill um, as their own prior to the Carnegie Institute or even since then. So Ben Ben could speak to this or even um, Nancy, uh, but uh, there the the. The five uh, southern tribes claim Tumamak Hill as a, a sacred place. Uh, there have been blessings and, and other kinds of, of events that are there. Um, I don't know how active they use the hill for ceremonial activities and whether it's done on a regular basis, uh, but I know they, they claim it as, as a sacred site. And again, part of this is this balance of, of uh, values means that we embrace that and it becomes just part of this kind of layered uh, cultural landscape that is, is the hill. So I don't know, Ben or Nancy, if you have any other comments. I can't really answer it um, more, more precisely than that. I, I can address it. It's a great question. It's all great questions. It's a fantastic presentation, Brooks. Um, the, the, what's been communicated to, to me um, from uh, especially the Aptum, but other mem uh, other Native nations as well, is um, direct erasure of uh, of that of the that understanding that recognition of this being first and for foremost an in an indigenous site um, and a cultural site in that way, and that it's that was directly communicated to me, for example, when presenting about. Um, some of the programs we were doing here, including the Friends of Tumalak program and shared that imagery of the, we used the, the Luminous Mother Shrine we were just talking about, and that that, that you, you didn't, picking that image as opposed to um, an image that may speak to uh, the indigenous nature and character of the, of the space is a, is a continuation of that erasure. And so there's been a lot of um, disenfranchisement and and a, and a feeling, and we've also gotten questions of, are we welcome, uh, autumn youth or elders, um, to come? And can we go to the top, you know, when we close the top of the hill to walking, to walkers, to preserve the archaeological elements? I was actually got to be up there with um, Chairman Ned Norris Jr., the current leader of the autumn, and he was explaining that he no longer goes that area with his daughter anymore because it says do not walk past this area. So there's um, all of that illuminates to me. We have a long way to go in, in addressing those concerns and, and issues. Um, and yeah, so it, it's not as direct as kind of a claim of ownership. It, it's, it, it, it's, good, it's pieces of that, but it's, it's unfortunately in the space of um, just a disenfranchisement across the border of generations. Any other questions? 
Brooks, can you talk a little bit about um, the, I'm just, like who were the architects that built the buildings? And I know there was the two phases, right? So there's the, the 1903 L that you showed the picture of, which I'm currently sitting in that piece, and then the expansion in 1906. And as I understand it, there were, uh, there was at least a different individual or partner brought in for the 1906 piece, but it's seamless. You can't even tell the addition. Are yeah. these, were they Tucson folks? Were they brought in? Like, what was going on that let them create such a desert adapted space? And where were their inspirations? I, I've never really understood all that context. Yeah, so uh, from an architectural historical perspective, uh, you know, 1903, there weren't a lot of uh, professionally designated architects in, in a place like Tucson. San Francisco, yes, but not Tucson. So true architects as professionals uh, were rare. And so you basically, you had builders uh, who, like their ancestors before them, had a particular craft and trade and were able to then follow suit. Um, and I think what you had is the, the, the two names that are associated with uh, the Desert Lab in particular are Forbes. And Forbes is, those of you familiar with the University of Arizona, it's actually the brother of the Forbes that is associated with the College of Agriculture. Um, and so he was, he was a builder and was able to, to build part of that. And, and then there was supervised construction by a guy by the name of Holmes. And Holmes was a professional architect in Tucson and built a number of early homes in the El Presidio area and a couple of buildings. He was a, a professor at the, in the um, College of Engineering at, at the University of Arizona. And he also designed Herring Hall as one of the buildings that he did. But Holmes was famous for the fact that he could, A, he was kind of an architectural eclectic. He sort of took whatever style was popular at the time. Uh, but B, he always incorporated kind of vernacular design approaches to whatever building he was doing. And so you can kind of see that in the, the kind of uh, the architecture you see on the hill was this idea of, of using very traditional kinds of forms like rectangulars and and um, L-shaped and U-shaped, uh, but using native stone, and as I mentioned before, the sort of very kind of clear design principles that everyone should follow in the desert when building uh, buildings. But you know, the subsequent buildings were frankly builders more than architects. There wasn't a, a high-styled uh, kind of architecture that was imposed on the land. And I think that first building set a precedent for the, the very sensitive approach to how the rest of the building compound, with the exception of the kind of World War II stuff, uh, but uh, the, the, the true kind of buildings on the hill. I have a question or, and a comment. Uh, my understanding is Godfrey Sykes was a, a big part of uh, the building the uh, buildings on Tumamak. And I had also read uh, that he had, uh, he built a house, he built a house that he lived in and I've never been able to really figure out which or where that is. Uh, you know, he built the boat house and, you know, right. was involved in all the other stuff. Uh, and I think it might be just to the east of where the entrance to Tumamak Hill is. That's, that's correct. You, you can see the house from the road. Um, it's, it's the property directly to the east um, of that. And um, he did build it and, um, it, you know, he claims to have had the first swimming pool in Tucson um, ah. at that property too. Oh, uh, yeah. But, you know, he was instrumental, but again, you know, it's this time where people were jacks of all trades uh, and, you know, built buildings and were entrepreneurs and, and you know, um, had, had uh, cultivated lands and were, were really doing a lot of different things. And, he being the scientist that he is, was just, I think, fascinated by wanting to create his own kind of um, building. Um, and he, you're right, he did the boathouse as well as his own house. Right, and I, I put the link to the article about him on the uh, tumamuk.org site. But anyway, I have talked about him in other meetings. I'm a big Godfrey Sykes fan. And uh, if you ever want to read more about him, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the book, A Westerly Trend, really will yep. make you a, a Godfrey Sykes fan. <laughs> <laughs> Good.
This is Anna. I have a question. Sure. Um, do you know the approximate R value of the walls in the lab? No. I'm always curious about that one. I won't even fake it. I won't even fake it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. What was the term you said? R value? The R value. R, okay. Yeah. R for resistance mm -hmm. of thermal, of thermal uh, trans transmission. And so was there another question, Caroline, was it? that Did you have a question? Yes, I did. It's not a question. It's a comment. I want to thank you because you really did a task analysis for me and you broke down the importance of, of Tumamak Hill, whether it was the cultural land or it was the economic value or whether it was the architect, but in, in the end, you brought it all together and uh, you made it, uh, it's really a place of sacredness and that it's not, uh, it's not all the pieces that right. are, are so important, but it's, it's like you said, it's uniquely Tucson. And uh, so thank you for your presentation and for putting it all into a wonderful perspective at the end. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, you, you, um, you probably have a lot of pity for my wife who, you know, I go down driving uh, Speedway and I see that as a cultural landscape too. And I can begin to pick apart all the various kinds of, you know, things that are there and try to derive meaning even from, from a streetscape of Speedway. Enough, enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Brooks, I guess I have a, a question, kind of piggybacking on Jeannie's question about Godfrey. I'm thinking about the role of individuals in shaping a place and a space in terms of the cultural landscape piece. And I'm curious, zooming out to the, the cultural landscapes as, as you did at the beginning and setting them and understanding spaces everywhere, how, I don't know as a, if this is a, from a academic perspective or just how does the impact of individuals on a space captured in this discipline or this approach of understanding a cultural landscape? Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I think, you know, each person brings with them a lens, right? And that lens is crafted by both their experiences and by their education and by their outlook. And, uh, and again, this is where I think you're the right leader of the hill. For now because I think your lens on this as an individual means that you are inclusive in ways that previous leadership has not. Uh, and so I think the idea that allowing for individuals in the way in which they sort of look at the hill and brought their own particular lens, and this is, was nothing for malintent as much as that was what they saw the purpose of the hill as, whether it was an ecological preserve or they were seen as a, or an archeological preserve or, or even as a, um, as a sacred place for native peoples. And so I think every individual comes onto the land, looks at it in, in with that particular lens. Um, and so each, each, each of those people represents fingerprints that are on that landscape. Um, and, and I think they represent the, the history and the evolution of how Tumamak Hill has come to be what it is right now. Incredible set of folks going yep. long, Absolutely. long. <clears throat> Lauren posted a, a question, um, and maybe we can maybe even follow up with some resources for you, Lauren. But do you have the recommendations for further readings on cultural landscape? Um, as she said, I find you can see the, the, the question there. Yeah. Sure. I'll, I'll type the name of the person I mentioned before. Uh, it's, it's JB Jackson. If you look up anything by him, um, he will, uh, that's a good place to start. Uh, then I think, you know, simply Googling it. And as I mentioned in one of the slides that I had up there, UNESCO has a definition of cultural landscapes um, as well as, you know, it's been in the domain of cultural geographers for a long time. And so they, they can, they've created a kind of a theoretical context around this idea of cultural landscapes. So depending on if you're wanting to go into kind of a theoretical construct of, 
of what cultural landscapes are. Um, that, that's one way to go through the cultural geographers. The others are, are much more um, ways in which, like in my presentation, they use it as a tool by which to embrace multiple lenses and multiple values of the landscape. So you can imagine a place like um, uh, uh, um, oh, Mount Graham, for example, right? And in the same way, uh, when you take a look at the multiple stakeholders and the multiple users and multiple value systems, and we begin to understand that you know, to many it's sacred, to many it's an ecological preserve for various species, uh, and yet there's an economic value and a research value that's given to that. And is there a way to bring harmony to all of those different values? And so that's, that's been a lot of the focus of a lot of these particularly federal agencies and world and international agencies like UNESCO to develop tools by which you develop consensus through a consultative process to recognize the values of each and come to a kind of a way in which you're able to negotiate uh, a path forward, recognizing all of those values and recognizing where the trade-offs are, uh, but defining the sort of common priorities um, that will kind of bring everyone together. Any other questions? I'm happy to share my slides. I'll I'll uh, I'll email them to to, uh, to well, Dan and to Trika. What I was going to say, Brooks, is is that we this is recording, and we have a, a Timamak Hill YouTube page where we post all of our presentations like that. And I'll make sure to resend that link to everyone and include you as well. So your slides will that I mean this will be on there right. um, as well. I'll. Um, post the uh, various comments from the group chat, um, including the you know, J.B. Jackson, Jackson and a, a couple of other um, references. Jeannie put um, that Godfrey Sykes reference there. Um, Brooke, I, could you please share and send your um, presentation to just so we have it on file. Sure, yep. Good point. And then um, I, I especially, I just wanted to say one thing, I really, especially appreciated how you referenced stewardship and stewards um, on Tim and Mock Hill because this group, um, they're called, we're called the Tim and Mock Stewards. And, um, you know, we mulled over that when, when we were commencing with this program. And uh, you just really affirmed that, that, that that was the right name because that's what all of you are doing and just really wanted to extend my gratitude not only to you Brooks but to all of these Tumumak stewards here are who are contributing to our cultural landscape um, up at Tumumak Hill. Well and I appreciate all of your efforts uh, this whole group because you are stewards and, and you become the ambassadors uh, for, for a, 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 like we were saying before a much more inclusive way of taking a look at the hill and protecting it for, for all of our common good so thank you all. Any other comments or questions? Well, it's right on the hour. I like to honor everybody's time. Um, and thank you again, Brooks and everyone. And keep an eye on your emails for all the resources and other opportunities. Great. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.